to our listeners. Welcome to the Filipino Free Thinkers podcast. That's also a video. Uh, this is another in our series of Conversations for a Cause, where we remind people to continue volunteering and helping and donating in whatever way that they can to the ongoing re- relief and rehabilitation effort in Visayas. So, um, hi, Guy. Welcome to the hi, show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I, I vividly remember the, the first time that I saw your book because I've already read about it online and I was quite surprised when I saw it in the religion section of a popular bookstore, the most popular bookstore in the country, National Bookstore. So, so I picked it up and I, I, think, I imagined what kind of mistake could they have made to put it like next to the Bibles and all of these other religious books. And I realized that um, 50 reasons people give for believing in a God. Like, um, it's a title that you could think is actually for believers. Uh, it's something that would make you to believe, believe in God more. I can imagine someone maybe doubting God who lost reasons to believe in God and, you know, pick it up so that they could get reasons. So did you foresee this kind of reaction to your, to your book? Yeah, well, I, I'm glad it was there because that's where I think it should be. I think it should be in that section because that's, that's, I wrote it in a way that was meant to be polite, respectful, and uh, productive, you know, not just some angry rant that no religious person would go anywhere near. I, I, I bent over backwards, did everything I could to make this book uh, welcoming and encouraging to believers to just consider what's going on in the minds of skeptics. Why is it that so many people around the world have doubts about their claims, you know, this is why. And any thoughtful religious person should want to know. They should be curious. They should want to know what is really going on in the minds of these skeptics. And you you often get a sort of distorted explanation from religious leaders. They, they just uh, dismiss atheists and skeptics as, you know, people who are inherently evil or stupid or crazy or they're possessed or something like that. And that's just not true, you know? I mean, skeptics are just people who are thinking and they have questions, questions that so far religious people haven't been able to answer adequately. I, I agree. Um, of course, your, your books are a lot more respectful, a lot more understanding. Like you mentioned, you bend over backwards so that believers could appreciate this. Now, the other approach, the approach that's usually taken by people like Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris in their previous books, do you think that kind of way of promoting skepticism has run its course? That, um, that a more uh, friendly or a more positive and respectful approach such as yours is what's needed in, in uh, our context today? Well, yes and no, yeah. But it, I should say, first of all, not every religious person thinks my books are as polite and gentle as I hoped they would. I mean, I, I've been called all kind of names, and you know, many people accuse me of being extremely rude and far too aggressive and all this. So a lot of this, it, it's subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. And as far as um, somebody like Richard, Docking, D- Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris being more aggressive than I am, yeah, I guess they are maybe in most cases. But in some areas, I get very aggressive. I get very aggressive when uh, I'm dealing with preachers who just blatantly are exploiting poor people and taking money from them so that they can live in luxury. You know, that really upsets me. I don't like it when, when uh, you know, good people trust their health to a faith healer rather than going and getting proper science-based medicine, you know, for something that's wrong with them. That's an extremely serious thing. And that's not really a time to be gentle and polite. You need to speak up aggressively and vigorously when that's going on. And so I think it, 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 you have to judge the situation each time. And as far as comparing me to Dawkins or Harris, um, I think it takes all kinds of voices. There are, look how many different kinds of religious people there are in the world. There are those who respond only to maybe somebody who's shouting a bit and raising their voice. That's going to get their attention. To other religious people, that will completely make them go away. And they are more likely to respond to somebody who's, you know, just kind of offering a friendly hand and wants to have a chat with them and just discuss religion with them and maybe challenge them a bit, but not be too harsh with them. So, you know, it takes all kinds of voices coming from the skeptical community. Yeah, I I agree. Um, when I read your books, uh, particularly those in the 50 series, like 
I, I recognize the principles of persuasion in them, and they're very effective. I can imagine how they could be more effective than, than the other books that we've been talking about. And it, it's in contrast with books such as Peter Boghossian's Manual for Creating Atheists. Like, it wears its intent on its sleeve. Like, while, while yours is kind of, it's kind of in there, it's kind of very subtle, but um, a lot of people could think that they'll pick up the book, they think that they were in for something else, but they, 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 they see something totally different. And do you think that there's something in disingenuous or you know, maybe yeah. dishonest about that kind of approach? Good question. <laughs> it, not intentional. No, I mean, right, you, know, you can read the first sentence in the introduction and see what it's all about. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to lure them in and do a bait and switch thing, nothing like that. I mean, it's completely honest, but absolutely, I guess, I guess the titles, you know, for example, the one 50 simple questions for every Christian, you know, could be just another one of those books written by a preacher, right? But I mean, yeah. you know, you, you should know before you purchase a book, I think you should flip through it and look, read the back. <laughs> so I'm not trying to trick anybody out of their money. But I, I think, I think my approach, um, it, it's, you know, it, people like Peter Bogosian, very effective. I mean, I'm a fan of his, okay? But I think my approach is effective with many people because there, there are certain things that go on in our brains. We all have these biases, these, the anchoring, we have confirmation bias, all these things that are natural to all of us, regardless of education or intelligence. And you have to understand that when somebody has a religious belief that they've had for a long time and they're very emotionally invested in it and it's tied in with their culture, their behavior, their family, their, their daily life, it's very tough to just find a crack in that and inspire them and get them to actually think and, and to consider, wait a minute, maybe this isn't the way I think it is. Maybe I should ask some more questions. Maybe I should reconsider all this. What am I really, is this all real, really there? Is it true? Is it real? And to do that, you, you need to almost become, I think, less, in, in many cases, not all cases, but it can be very effective to approach that person not as a not as a combatant not as the enemy not as an opponent not as a debating sparring partner but as a fellow human being who you are just trying to help out and just help them see the world a little more clearly maybe and i always listen as well i don't feel like i certainly don't feel like i have all the answers i don't feel like i'm the smartest guy in the universe so when i talk to religious people and i try my best to encourage them to think critically I'm also listening. I, I force myself to keep an open mind. I always listen to what they say. Even if I've heard it a million times, I'll listen one more time. Because uh, skeptics are no different from believers in the fact that we too have all these biases. And we have to be on guard against confirmation bias. And we have to be on guard against uh, just uh, following the herd of our own, our own herd of skeptics and thinking, ah, oh, yeah, we've got it all figured out. This is our club and we're sticking to our guns. No, you, we could be wrong. We think they're wrong. Let's listen. We both need to listen. Both camps have to respect each other enough and try to, try to, uh, you know, we're, we should all be on the same side, heading for reality and truth. That's what we're looking for. We shouldn't be always butting heads. We should, we should try to, just reframe the whole equation and say, you know what? We're all just looking to find out what's real. It's like a math equation. Let's find the answer together. That's what I'm trying to do. So I, I was. I was mentioning that um, in any case, like your books, I think are very effective. And I was talking to Peter Bogosian about a street epistemology. I was talking about John Loftus, about the outsider test for faith. And I was talking in particular about the effectiveness of the, the, the approaches that they use, like um, in concrete terms, like how many people do you think it, it, it converts um, how it, how fast that it does it work? Like, do you have any experience about that? Like, people talking to you about what your books have done for them in terms of changing their minds? Oh yeah, I've I've had tremendous feedback. I mean, I don't have I ha you know I I would never try to make it sound scientific in any way. I don't have any hard studies with data, but my first book, Fifty Reasons People Give for Believing in a God, was published in two thousand eight, and since then, that's about five years ago. Since then. I've gotten tremendous feedback from that book from all over the world and from both believers and non-believers. And it's, you know, some of it's negative, but most of it is profoundly positive. I mean, I, for example, I got a message from 
a, a young person, I don't even know, I never knew if it was a male or female, in Kuwait, but it was a teenager who somehow got their hands on that book and said their family was extremely, uh, you know, fundamentalist Muslim. And uh, the person had to tear the cover off the book and like read it in secret and all this. But uh, he or she said that the book, you know, profoundly changed them, opened their eyes and made them appreciate the world better and appreciate their life better, which is, you know, that's great because that's, that's all I've wanted to do is just help people live more realistic lives and get more out of their life and not, not waste too much time on things that are probably not true. And I, you know, having said that, let me add for any religious people that are listening, I am, I do not 100% condemn all religions. I know of course that many good things come out of religion. Many, many, many good people call themselves religious, and that uh, religion does inspire many wonderful things today and throughout history. However, I'm just honest about all the bad stuff that comes with it, and I'm also just, uh, you know, I'm very, uh, I, I see it as a moral issue that we, if religion is so important, okay, and it causes all these problems, then we need to be grown-ups about it and really think about it in an honest way critical fashion. We need to get real about it and not just trust it because our parents told us it was true or because our culture reinforces it. We have to do this. So yeah, the books, anyway, to answer your question, yeah, all my books, I've gotten tremendous feedback that's been so positive from all around the world. So yeah, it does work. And what, what, what really uh, is most rewarding is that a common theme from many of them, and even this, my latest book called Think, I've been getting a lot of feedback already from that one. It's only been out a few weeks. And people, a consistent thing from people in different countries are saying that it's a life-changing book. They use that phrase, life-changing book, which is weird because it's not like they're all together and they just kind of copied each other and said the same thing. So when I'm hearing people from different parts of the world say life-changing, that's good because that's what I want. You know, I just want to help people. I don't, I'm not, I'm not out to rain on anybody's parade and be the, uh, the destroyer of religions or something. I don't want to start a religion of Guy Harrison, you know, nothing like that at all. I want people to think for themselves and figure things out on their own. So I'm just trying to inspire and shed a little light on the subject. That's it. I completely agree with what you said. I can totally appreciate that. Like our group is a free thinking group. Like we have members who are still part of religion and they don't mind their religions being criticized when it deserves criticism. So yeah. So yeah, I agree. Um, That's good. You know, you know, I should say too. I mean, I have no problem with religion, really. I don't care if people are religious. I, I, I have many friends who are religious. It's not a source of conflict for us. I have family members who are not a problem at all, unless I see them harming themselves or others, or slowing human progress, or being anti-science because of that religion. Then I call them on it. But otherwise, it's fine. That's their business. What goes on in somebody else's head is their business. That's fine with me. And there are many aspects of religion that I am close to. For example, my family, we celebrate Christmas. You know, we do the Christmas tree thing. We do all that. It's, it's, it's a cultural event. We enjoy it. It's fun. I don't see any contradiction in it. It's fine. It's like Halloween. You know, I don't believe in ghosts, but we still celebrate Halloween. No big deal. But uh, yeah, go ahead. So of the 50... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try to shorten my answers for you, okay? I, I tend to talk too much. No, it's okay. It's okay. I, I enjoy your answers, of course. And of the 50 reasons people give for believing in a God, like what do you think is the toughest one to let go of? Um, a tough one to let go of? One of the reasons? Yeah. One of, what is the toughest, yeah. in your opinion, for, for your readers to let go yeah, of? Yeah. Well, uh, um, one of the most common justifications that I've heard, and it's not just Christianity we're talking about, by the way. We're talking Islam, Hinduism, Judaism. Uh, one of the most common is that People say, it makes me happy. Yeah. And that's a reason they want to keep it. And it's also a justification. In their mind, it is part of the reason they are convinced it is real. Because they get so much joy from it. It makes them feel happy. They go to a church service, and they are, they are just charged up. They feel electrified. And they, get a, they, get a, they have an experience of, of some sort of pure joy that they just can't explain. It. They don't get it in any other aspect of life. And they say... God must be real. Jesus has to be real or Allah must be real because I'm feeling, I'm having this experience. And then of course, you know, the skeptic's reaction is that, well, 
there are other reasons for that, okay? I mean, you can feel spiritual, transcendent. You can have all these experiences, and that, doesn't, that means you're human. It doesn't mean necessarily there's something supernatural going on. We know that, and I try to explain that. But that's a very difficult challenge for someone. If, if something is really making you happy, and, you know, it, why would you want to give it up? And what I have discussed that with believers, and I say, well, if it makes you that happy, don't give it up. Keep, keep going. However, you don't have to surrender your brain. You can still think. You can still go to church and think. If you love the singing, if you love being around people, uh, socializing with other church people, if you love praying, you know, prayer is a form of meditation, which is probably healthy for you to just sit, relax, lower your heart rate, and talk to yourself. You know, it's probably pretty healthy. Lower your blood pressure or whatever. So if these things, if these things are good for you, if they make you so happy, it might, sound, it might sound strange coming from me, but I say keep it. Keep doing it. But don't, it doesn't mean you still can't be a good skeptic. Be a cultural Christian. Like, you know, there are many cultural Jews, people who are passionately Jewish, and they participate in everything Jewish, but they don't believe in God. They're atheists. You know, and and yeah. and still get so much joy, and they have they have that feeling of unity and tradition with their faith, but they're not faithful. They're they're non-believers, and you can do that in any religion. You really can. You can still read the Bible and find your wisdom in it. You can still go to church. You can do all those things without having to sacrifice your ability to think. And I agree with you again. You mentioned about um, cultural Christians, and we have a lot of those in the group. They they're atheists, they're skeptics, they're, they're no longer part of that, that faith, but they celebrate Christmas. And uh, about your book, 50 Questions for, for Every Christian, like let's say there's, there's an atheist and he's like having Christmas dinner with his family. Like which of those 50 questions would you think is a nice sort of discussion starter that, that could lead into those more tough tougher questions, but, you know, uh, as a nice starter, what would you recommend? Uh, they can all lead to trouble at the dinner table, so <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough one. I would say, uh, you know, something like uh, miracles. What, what are miracles? There's a chapter on that. And I explain how this whole thing of miracles is really, it, it's a misperception. It's a, it's a, it's a, a laziness. Something happens, you can't explain it. So you say, it must be magic. It has to be God. It, it, ha it can't be just a natural thing because I don't understand it. I don't understand why that just happened. Or my, my uh, sister had cancer and the doctor said she was you know, going to die, but she didn't. It just went away. Must be a miracle, right? No, something happened. You're not sure what. So ignorance is not an answer. You know, ignorance of something is, it means you don't know. It doesn't mean you know. So you, you could explain that and someone can still be religious and see that. And I give examples and I kind of walk people through in that chapter how to see that, oh yeah, right, I get it. These things we call miracles are just mysteries. Often they're not mysteries. They can be explained if you look into it not by natural means. But simply not knowing something is not an answer. It doesn't mean it's a miracle, a supernatural miracle. So that's a good way because even religious people who are sensible and thoughtful will, you know, many times go, yeah, I see your point. You're right. You know, if I brought, you know, one example I give, if I had a time machine and I went back and grabbed a Neanderthal from 50,000 years ago in the Ice Age or something, brought him back to modern times and I showed him a television and I showed him a microwave, you know, oven and I showed him automobiles going by on the highway, he would think, my gosh, this must be the work of God. This is magic. Because his frame of reference, it would be impossible for him to imagine a natural explanation for these things. But that doesn't make them actually magical. So anyway, go from that. And then I would jump to the more difficult things like, you know, the, uh, the sacrifice of Jesus. You know, why, why do we need to be saved by God when God is the one who's threatening to send us to hell? Like, what, what sense does this make? I would get into the deeper things. Maybe after you've already eaten and you're having dessert, maybe I'd hit that stuff. <laughs> so I'll try that out and, let, and I'll let you know how it goes. Okay. Uh, in 50 popular beliefs that people think are true, of course, you wrote about a whole bunch of things that, you know, superstitious things, um, unscientific, irrational things. What do you think are the common ones that even skeptics fall for? Oh, um, I would say that that are in that that I mentioned in that book. 
well, a good skeptic, really, none of those, I don't think, you know, but <laughs> um, shouldn't anyway. But we can. I mean, uh, there's a few in there that got me earlier in life. For example, I, I have a chapter on uh, this claim, you know, chariots of the gods, the claim that ancient in ancient times, astronauts from other galaxies or planets came to the Earth and they taught us how to build pyramids and brush our teeth or something because we were just animals and they really? kind of civilized us, you know. <laughs> so, and and I, when I was young, when I was about 12 years old or something, I saw a documentary about Chariots of the Gods and it just reeled me in hook, line, and sinker. It got me. I was completely, I thought, oh, this must be real. Look at all the evidence, you know. <laughs> and then fortunately, a few weeks later, I saw another documentary that was on a PBS station, Nova, a really great show called Nova, that just debunked the whole thing. And I went, wow. And it was a really, uh, it was a really important moment for me because it taught me that, hey, just because some guy is on television wearing a tie and you know, looks, looks like somebody respectable doesn't necessarily mean he knows what he's talking about. You know? <laughs> so you have to be skeptical. You've got you to make sure you're not being hoodwinked by these people. So yeah, I mean, even good skeptics can fall for things. But I tell you, if, if you, you know, if you see what I'm saying in my books, it's pretty simple to knock these things down. When somebody comes to you with a claim that is just so extraordinary and so bizarre and so amazing, there's a few questions you can ask. There's a few things you should demand. And you've got to make sure the evidence sort of balances the weight of the claim. Okay? If it's a big claim, you're going to need a lot of evidence. All right. Yeah. Just the fact if it's if it's if somebody's telling you that an alien spaceship, you know, hovered over their house last night, the eyewitness account is not enough. You need more. You need more than a grainy photo. You need a lot of evidence. You need a piece of the spaceship or something, okay? Maybe it's true, but you should withhold your belief until they can prove it. So yeah, it's it's pretty easy to see through these things once you become a good skeptic who is consistent in your thinking. So extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And yeah. But, you know, say what you will about Absolutely. these people and their evidence, but they can make awesome documentaries <laughs> that can reel people in. Um, yeah. One of the, those uh, misconceptions, unscientific, irrational things, um, you, you dedicated an entire book to, the one about race and reality, right? Like, why do you think that it was um, such an important topic? Like, what are the implications of people believing wrong things about race? And... Uh, yeah, why is that important? Why is it important to correct that? Yeah, it's extremely important. I mean, obviously, I think so. I wrote a whole book about it. Um, that's that one right there. There you yeah. go. But I, I uh, yeah, I'm I'm troubled by the fact that so much pain and suffering and death has been caused for so long in human history because we believe in these things called biological races. We believe that nature has somehow imposed these distinct categories of people that are very fundamentally, very different in important ways, mentally and physically, socially. And these differences are so important that they have caused people to abuse one another and exploit one another and kill one another. And still today, you know, the problem of racism is still here. And it's sometimes it's not overt, sometimes it's not deadly, but it is still a problem. It's still a drag on human progress. It's still unfair, and it's still not allowing us to truly appreciate who we are. And it also discourages us from really appreciating and understanding the human story, who we are, and how we really, how we actually connect with each other. And how we see the reality is that we're a very closely related young species compared to the rest of the animal kingdom. We're, we're very closely related. We are all cousins. I mean, that's, that's a fact. And we may look different. We may have certain differences, but they are very superficial. And, they're, and, and on top of that, there's so many problems with the idea of, of distinct biological races. People think, we think we know it, but it's a lot like religion. It's like, like a fundamentalist religion. It relies on being scientifically illiterate. It relies on an over-reliance on tradition. It relies on trusting what mommy and daddy told you, even if the evidence doesn't match. And so you end up being a race believer for your whole life. And the problem is you're not, you're not really embracing the rest of humankind as you should, as a fellow equal family member, because that's what we are. And so anyway, I wrote this book to explain, you know, in easy terms that anybody can understand. Really, it's what the anthropologists have been saying for 50 years now, but the message just doesn't get out to everyday people. So 
I, I hope that, you know, eventually we're going to figure this out and realize, oh, this is not that big a deal. Because if you, yeah, we can look at some people and say, you know, that guy's from Africa. I can tell. But you know what? Not always. I've been to Fiji. I've been to Papua New Guinea. And there are people there who are dark skinned. They have hair similar to Af dark skinned Africans. And I could put them side by side and you would not know which one was from Africa and which one was not despite the fact that they are so far apart they're among the they have the most genetic distance between them probably than anybody on earth you know Pacific Islanders and dark-skinned Africans they're very very far apart and Africa for example a lot of people will think well black people come from Africa that's one race black people now, that's absurd if you if you understand who we are how we evolved what our, what our blood and genes say about us today, then you would never say that because just in Africa alone, there is so much genetic diversity. People on that continent, maybe they have similar skin color, but that's about it. Because, for example, I, as a so-called white Euro, European American, I am probably much more closely related to a typical Ethiopian than a West African would be related to a typical Ethiopian. And now nobody would ever think that. They're both just black people, right? But no, that's not the true story of who we are. Um, yeah, I'm I, I just reminded about when you show the, the book. I found it. I, I got the copy back. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Good. All but, right. But, um, of course, the race is a very important issue and it, its implications are very important and serious. But the other things that you research in the book are not as harmful, if, even if you believe them. And I, I'm sure that some of them were a lot of fun to, to read about. Like, what in particular was your favorite, like, uh, of those 50 things that pop people believe are true? You know, what had you... This one. We're talking about this one now. That one. <laughs> After, okay, okay, gotcha. All so right. what is, what's the um, most fun to research for you? Yeah, you know, I, so, you know, this may surprise people, but I love a lot of that stuff. I just love it, you know. I, for some things I don't. I don't like psychics. I don't like psychic readings because I think that takes advantage of people, and I think it's just a con job in almost every case. I don't like mediums, you know, people who claim to talk to dead people because they often say, oh, you know, your mother died. I'm talking to her now. Give me $100. I'll tell you what she said. I mean, I, that is not fun. Yeah. But things like UFOs, I love it. I love, I love just thinking about it. There's no evidence that any have ever been here, but guess what? <laughs> I, <laughs> see, I'm, I'm a skeptic, and I have the skull of an alien in my house, a replica skull of an alien in my house. You know, I love that stuff. The idea of, um, of extraterrestrials visiting the Earth, you know, that's fantastic. I mean, I'm a fan of SETI, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I visited their, their offices and all. I love all that stuff. I'm so, I'm so hopeful that maybe we'll find life on another planet. It's possible. You know, there's so much, there's so many opportunities for life in this universe. It might be likely. It might be certain. Who knows? We don't know, but it's certainly worth thinking about and looking. Um, other things, uh, I would say cryptozoology this this uh, sort of pseudoscience yeah it's a it's a pseudoscience where people are looking for these mythical creatures you know bigfoot uh the the abominable snowman the loch ness monster these kind of things but you know what i love looking for monsters i think it's cool but i tell people who are cryptozoology fans i say you know what if you like monsters, if you're like me and you're turned on by monsters and mystery and searching for weird creatures, well, guess what? That's what scientists do. They're finding weird creatures in the ocean every day. They're finding weird stuff in the Amazon rainforest all the time. They're finding new insects. They're finding new birds, new monkeys even. I mean, they're all, there's so much. And then if you even shrink it down, the microbial world, bacteria, viruses, they're the mites. There is so much waiting for us to find and learn about and and it and believe me the little world has more monsters than we could ever need i mean there are monsters living on us on our face you know on our skin there's all kinds of stuff going on all around us that is absolutely fascinating so once again you don't have to give up your thinking in order to find a thrill or find a monster yeah i, I like how, how you explain that like it's as if 
you know, you use science fiction to lure people into getting more into science, and you look, you yeah. use superstitious beliefs like that to to learn more about science, and I, I like it. Yeah. Um, your yeah. La- your latest book, which I'm sure you have in front of you, and you can show us right now. Think. Think. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. We'll we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, okay. And it was recommended by Random House for all freshman students in the U.S., and that's really awesome. Um, I do think that critical thinking should be something taught to young people as early as possible. Uh, what other books do you think should be recommended reading um, for for young students? Like, of course, aside from yours. Um, and I'm sure that you can write a book about the 50 books that you know <laughs> freshman students should be reading. Yeah, but yeah. for now, like, give us just maybe three. Yeah. Um, couple, well, there's so many. One comes to mind is uh, Brain Rules. Brain Rules. I've read it's that. It's by yeah. a... Oh, you have? Yeah, it's a good book. It's by uh, John Medina, I believe. And it's a real simple to read book. And I recommend it for anyone, young people especially, though, because it just gives some 12, I think it's 12 basic rules about what you should know about your brain and how you should be how you should be taking care of it and I touch on a lot of that and think actually I quote him a bit and I think that's a really good book um, another one maybe Michael Shermer has uh, the believing brain which is a good book about skeptical thinking and science um, but probably the you know the number one okay the number one book that every young person in the world should read this is number two okay but number one <laughs> Number one is The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan, Sagan yes, of course. Yeah, I think, because I think that book, um, it's just, it's got a lot in it, and he, he's so elegant with his words, and it's just, um, I don't know, it made an impact on me many, many years ago, and I think it, it has done that to many others. So I'm sure it'll keep making an impact on people if they read it. So I would highly recommend that book. Um, good, good choices, and uh, I've read all, all right. of them. I'm, I'm happy to say that I've read all of them. Of course, you have. So, yeah. so you call weak skepticism the world's great unrecognized crisis. So, so why is this? What is weak skepticism, and why do you think that that it's yeah, uh, yeah the world's great unrecognized crisis? Yeah, well, I call I call it weak skepticism because you know I've thought about this, and it's you can't say people are just not skeptical because everybody is skeptical to some degree you know nobody believes everything you know in fact some of the best skeptics you'll ever find when it comes to islam are christians and some of the best skeptics of christianity are muslims you, you know so yeah. it's just where they focus it and how consistent they are so yeah you and you'll have some people who think psychics are absolutely you know totally real and yet they think ufo's are silly you know, so people are, people are skeptical in different ways. But this problem of weak skepticism, it really is a global crisis. And it really is just virtually unnoticed. You know, people like you and I are saying, hey, wait, something's going on here. We need to think better. This is crazy. We're living in a crazy world here. But you and I, unfortunately, are in a very small minority. Hopefully that's changing. But, I, I, you know, what I, what I say in my books is that this global crisis of weak skepticism is extremely serious because it literally costs us trillions of dollars, millions of lives. You know, millions of people suffer because they don't know, they, they, they don't, they're so weak in their skepticism, so inconsistent with it, that they will, you know, go to some medical quack to get treatment for something that a real doctor could probably help them out with. And so they will harm their health. They'll waste their money. They'll harm, harm their health. There are people who spend countless hours worrying about astrology or ghosts or or gods or something and instead of spending more time with their children instead of you know enjoying life and being romantic with their spouse or whatever they're doing this this stuff that is probably a waste of time and that's a tragedy you know we shouldn't be we shouldn't do that and there's so many another problem is weak skepticism is direct correlation to the big problem with democracies, you know, even though democracy is probably the best form of government we could possibly have, I guess, but the problem is that 
so many societies that are democratic keep electing idiots. We keep <laughs> electing, yeah, we keep electing stupid people who really shouldn't be running countries and they shouldn't be representatives. They're just not up to the task. And why does that happen? Because people are not good critical thinkers and they believe nonsense that politicians throw at them. They're not thinking. And so they just follow the herd and they vote for this guy and he turns out to be a total moron, you know, and that's destructive to their country and the world. Happens all over the place. Every country from the richest to the poorest, all of them. And so, so you know, I, I try to get people to recognize the importance of this. It's not just a silly game of saying, oh, come on, that house is not haunted. Come on, don't be silly. It's, not, it's much more serious than that. We're talking, you know, being skeptical can literally save your life. It might. It just might. And it can certainly set you up to live a safer and more efficient life. Yeah, I keep repeating this in the in the interviews and I keep telling about this site, it's where's the harm? Like if you think that your belief, you know, doesn't ha doesn't affect anyone, just go to the website, where's the harm? You can Google it. Right. And you yeah, can I see know. all of the... Yeah. So... I agree. That I agree. That's an excellent website. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, whoever does that, they do a good job because, they are, yeah, yeah, like you said, I do encourage people to check that out because there's just, you know, documented article, news article after news article of people who, you know, killed their children yeah. trusting in prayer or trusting in homeopathic medicine or something you know so it's it's dangerous um so students reading your book i believe that it's reasonable to think that you're increasing their chances of leaving religion by by reading a critical thinking book like that so have you received complaints from concerned parents or you know guardians about this this possibility yeah, in a personal way I have, yeah. I uh, used to live in the Cayman Islands. In the, that's a small country in the Caribbean. And it's very uh, strongly Christian, very, you know, very fundamentalist Christian. And uh, probably similar to the Philippines, really. I mean, just a really strong cr Christian atmosphere throughout the country and government and stuff. You just feel it everywhere. And, uh, you know, I love the country. I love the people. You know, I had great years there. But... um some people it was very awkward and they just they just couldn't wrap their head around what i was saying and how how i was just you know i was encouraging them to ask questions and think for themselves but they just couldn't get past the idea that somehow i was attacking them and i was trying to mislead or betray you know the young people who couldn't think for themselves ironically they were they were they were practically you know some some just a few but we're accusing me of almost trying to instill some sort of faith in me <laughs> you know like what have just trust me i know what i'm saying like i was trying to be some sort of weird cultish leader to turn them away from christianity you know so that was kind of bizarre to deal with but you know it wasn't a big problem yeah still related to this question like um greta christina i was talking to her earlier and she told me about how her parents raised her to, to have the choice of what to believe when the time came. And as a result, even critical thinking wasn't taught to her when she was young. So, so what, what's your take on this? Because some people think that if you kind of indoctrinate, can you say that about critical thinking? When you, when you, in, when you teach Ooh. children <laughs> critical thinking, like you predispose them to a certain way of thinking that, and you rob them of the freedom of religion to to be religious i know it's twisted but try to give an well, answer to know, those people yeah yeah maybe you do well you only rob them of the possibility of being religious later in life if religion can't stand up to the questions that's the only way if if there is a religion out there that can stand up to very basic simple scrutiny that comes from critical thinking then maybe it will survive the gauntlet and get into their head you know but no i mean i, I disagree with that because you know i i as i raised my children when they were young i constantly wanted them to think for themselves not to copy me not to agree with me about everything i want them to be independent thinkers that's what you want because when i when they leave me and go out into the world i'm not going to be there to say oh don't believe that you can trust that you can't trust this you can't you know i'm not going to be there they're going to have to do it on their own and so i feel one of the most important things i could have done as a father is is get them going on that track so that they can be 
good thinking human beings who can who are ready for that onslaught of madness that's going to come at them out in the real world they're going to be they're going to be hit with con artists they're going to be hit with crazy people they're going to be hit by well-meaning people who are deluded and they're all going to be coming trying to sell them something get them to join whatever and if they're not ready they're going to end up being suckers. They're going to be victims. And I don't want that. So I teach them how to ask questions. I teach them to be courageous enough to ask questions and to be courageous enough to accept the answers or the non-answers when they come. So yeah, I, I think bottom line, teach your children to be skeptics. I mean, because you, you know, I say this to religious people a lot. I say, look, I, I'm encouraging skepticism. I'm not attacking your religion. If skepticism tears down your religion, then something's wrong with your religion. It's not, the skepticism's not the problem. Skepticism is a good thing. Skepticism is how we figure out what's a lie, what's, what's fake, and what's a mistake. That's, that's good, right? We want to know those things, right? So if your religion teeters and trembles, you know, when skepticism comes around, then you need to check your religion. Um, I, I agree completely. Um, despite your book and others like it, irrationality and superstition and basically bad ways of thinking will be around for a very, very long time. So do you think that there's hope for humanity? Like, um, oh, do yeah. you think that you will live long enough to see the fruits of your labor? That is like live in a world where, that is more skeptical and rational and scientific. I already have. I've already seen it. I'm already living in that world to a point because, you know, I... When I was a child, I grew up in the United States in the South and in Florida. And it was, uh, you know, mostly it was a small town, mostly conservative, very Christian. And I never even heard the word atheist. I, I can't, I, I probably didn't hear the word atheist until I was maybe 13 or 14, probably. <laughs> Just the concept of challenging religion and questioning it. It never, even though, it, funny, I never. I never heard anybody say that, but I question religion myself, even as it was being, you know, kind of pushed on me throughout childhood. I was constantly skeptical in the privacy of my mind. I was asking questions. I was doubting all along. But what's interesting is that back then, I couldn't imagine coming out and saying, hey, you know what? None of this makes sense to me. I don't think this is real. I mean, I, I, I couldn't even, I, it never even occurred to me to do that, you know, but now, Almost every high school in America probably has some sort of a little secular club and every college, you know, virtually every college probably has some sort of a non-believer club or association. And now it's, it's becoming more and more open. It's talked about. I mean, the, uh, the Internet, for all its faults and its problems, it does a lot of harm, of course, but the Internet has also allowed this thing to flourish a lot and make people realize, wow, I'm not alone. There's people in the Philippines you know, who are like me and are ha asking these same questions. There are people all over the world. And so in my books, I could, you know, the fact that I've written five books, four of which, uh, three of which very strongly uh, address religion from a skeptical perspective and one that does a little bit, um, the fact that those books have been published and are successful, I, I, couldn't, even I couldn't have imagined that. 30 years ago, you know, I mean, I, I didn't even, you know, that's before the God delusion and all that stuff. I mean, you know, it would be hard to think that could happen in America, you know, or that my book would be in the Philippines being read by people there, you know, so, so it's a, you know, there are signs of progress everywhere. Is it enough? No, we, we, there's so much work to be done. Like I said, this is the global crisis, you know, we need to keep working hard, very hard on this because, like I said, it's a moral issue. You know, people are hurting, people are suffering because they're not good skeptics. So the more people we can inspire, the better. I agree. And um, you promised me this. And this is the bonus for, for the, the writers who are listening. Like, what is your secret? What is your secret to being a prolific writer? Oh. Like, you'll be <laughs> empowering critical thinkers to spread the word out there. So you owe it to us. Like, what is your secret? I, I will share my secret with you. And it is absolutely foolproof. I figured it out. In 2007, I figured it out. I, I walked around for, I was a journalist working in a newspaper. I walked around, and even before that, when I was a college student, I walked around maybe 15 years saying, you know what, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to do it. I, can, I know it's in me. I can do it. I want to get a book published. I want to see my name on the cover of a book. I can do it. I have something to say to the world. I want to do it. For 15 years, I kept doing that. And then one day, 
I said, wow, maybe I should start writing. <laughs> and I said, and so I actually sat down. I had an idea for a book, got me all excited, came to me in the shower or whatever, got all excited. I outlined it. I came up with chapter titles. I, I calculated the math. I said, okay, this many words for that chapter, that chapter. Does it add up to enough for a book? And then here's the magic. Okay, you ready? Here's the secret. I sat my ass down and I wrote 500 to 1,000 words a day. And I made it happen. And I did. I didn't stop. It was like I got on. It was like I got on a roller coaster and I didn't get off until it was done. And there were times when I was writing crap. It was horrible. It was, it, I, I said, this is terrible. But you know what I figured out? Having a thousand words of bad writing is much better than no words. So I would just say, you know what? It, this may, what I'm writing today may suck and it's going to need a lot of work, but I can fix it. And it's easier to fix something than to have a blank screen with nothing on it and try to make something. So I just kept plowing away, plowing away. And I almost had this, you know, pardon the word, I had this faith. <laughs> I had this faith in myself that somehow at the end I was going to have, you know, 90,000 words that somehow I could finesse and polish and, and take the stink off of and make something that resembled a proper book. And so I just kept plowing away, plowing away. And then I did it. And at the end, it worked. It actually worked. And it got published. And people liked it. And then I realized, wow. And the real, the secret, I'm telling you, this is not a joke. The secret really is that you need to just, you need to find the good idea that really gets you excited. Then you need to organize it a bit and just make sure you've got enough there and you can do it. You've got enough words to, you know, work with. And then you just Get on, that, get on the train and don't stop till you finish. And then you can fix it. And, and along the way, you will lose confidence and you will be certain that you're doing complete garbage work. Keep working, keep working. Go back and fix it later. Just keep going, keep going until you get to the end. And it works. I've written, I've written five books in five years, you know, and, and I, I just and still manage to be a pretty good father. My children still know me. I still play with them and all. So I'm not like a recluse. I'm not a hermit or anything like that. But um, yeah, that is the key. You have to be consistent and just, just make it part of your life and do it like clockwork. Don't wait for inspiration. Don't wait for when everything's clicking and you've got Mozart you know, playing and you've got tea brewing and everything feels good and the words are just flowing and all. When that happens, great. But it doesn't happen it usually doesn't happen. So it's work. You have to do it. You got to just make it come. Uh, Guy, thank you so much for your time. And um, what's your next book? Anything you'd like to, to plug other than your, your current books to all of our listeners? Yeah, I'm working on, well, I finished a science fiction novel and it's 100,000 words of total crap, which I am now trying to polish and make into something that resembles a good book. <laughs> but I finished that. I'm so happy about that. That was hard to get through because it's my first you know, attempt at fiction. But that's, that's done. So I'm working on that now. The first draft is done. But I'm also working on a, a sort of a, uh, a science-minded daily devotional, sort of borrowing from the Christian devotional, the daily devotional. Well, I'm yeah. doing one for skeptics and science, science thinkers. And it'll be called The Bedside Brain or The Daily Thinker or something like that. And I'm excited about that because I think it's fun. It'll be for everybody. You know, it'll be a good book. And then I've got another one I'm working on. I'm still organizing in my head. It's going to be about the, uh, the divisions in the world, the things that divide us and cause so many problems in the world and really keep us from solving problems together and from living, you know, in peace. And, and just it's a big problem in our world is manufactured divisions, divisions that don't need to be like race, religion. Uh, gender to a degree, and uh, uh, nature, how we separate ourselves from nature or we think we do, things like that, like divisions that are a big problem but really shouldn't be. So that's, you know, that's a, I think that'll be an important book, I hope. It seems that once you get on that train, you, you don't get off. Yeah, like in your don't case, get so. off that train, man, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for your time, and I hope that we could talk again next time. Oh, listen, anytime, man. I am, I am so happy that we got to talk, really. Your questions are, are brilliant. You're a great guy, and I really, really support your show. Anything I can ever do to support you guys, you let me know, okay? Because I, I really admire what's happening in the Philippines. You know, it's such a, I know it's such a strongly religious country. And to see this sort of upwelling of, you know, appreciation for science and, and uh, the promotion of skepticism and stuff, it's fantastic, man. You, you guys, people like you, you are making your society better 
by stirring this up. And, you know, I just encourage you, as you do it, be, be forceful and loud, but always be respectful, always be peaceful, always be, you know, always be understanding. Always remember that the people you're, you're trying to reach, you know, they're just your brothers and your sisters, you know? They're not the enemy. They're just you guys because it could easily be you on the other side of that line, you know? It could be me. I mean, that's, that's just how it is. We're all humans. So always remember that, you know? And, but keep it up. You guys are doing really good work. That's a perfect message to end the show with. Thank you, Guy. And right. so we'll end the, the discussion, I mean, the recording here. Thank you again so much. Okay. Um, thank you for all those writing tips. Um, I'm one of those. Right. I, I, I perfectly understand, like, w the wanting to write, you know, the, the saying, yeah. I have a book in me, but not Do really it, getting you, hey, to it. I can tell, <laughs> listen, I just, talk, I just talked to you for an hour, and I can tell you're a smart guy. You need to start writing. You got some stuff to say. Thank I can you. tell. Thank I can you. Tell. But I'm telling you, man, don't, it's true. Don't wait for inspiration. Don't wait for it to be easy because it's not easy. And even if it feels like it's really not that good, you'll be surprised. Sometimes, sometimes I wrote stuff and I thought, oh, this is garbage. And then I read it a month later and I went, wow, that's pure poetry. You know? <laughs> so you never know. You never know what a little time and distance does to your perception, you know. So, yeah, man, just do it. Just plug away. Yeah, I'll help you in any way, man. Seriously, you contact me anytime. Thank I'll, you. I'll Thank help you so any much. Advice really you appreciate like it. That. Okay? I'll let All you right, know buddy. once this recording is up. Um, okay. All again, right. um, have a nice day or what time is it there? Sorry. Yeah, it's nighttime. I'm going to bed. Yeah, so good night. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. All right, buddy. Take care. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're welcome. And goodbye. Bye.